I remember as a young Christian, uh, someone in our church handed me a small book called The Cross and the Switchblade. Some of you older saints may remember that. Uh, In fact, there was a movie made in 1970 based on that book, and it was starred Eric Estrada of Chips fame. You might remember him. He must be 162 by now. And Pat Boone, right? You might remember him. He's even older than that, okay? But I remember reading that, and it's a biographical account of the ministry of Pastor David Wilkerson uh, as he was uh, led of the Lord to go leave his town in Philadelphia to go minister the gospel to the street gangs in Brooklyn. And the book also chronicles the radical salvation of a notorious gang leader by the name of Nicky Cruz. Now, Nicky Cruz led one of the toughest gangs in New York City there at the end of the 1950s. So this took place several decades ago. And and Nicky had a a very troubled childhood. Uh, His parents brutally abused him. By the time he was a teenager and hit the streets, his heart was so hardened. uh, He was devoid of any capacity to love. All that was in his heart was hatred. Hate, hate, hate. And he, the one thing he did enjoy was hurting people. That's what he loved doing, actually. The only path for his life at this point, at this stage of his life, was prison or death. And certainly, apart from Christ, it was hell. Now, David Wilkerson was a pastor in a very small town in Philadelphia and had read an article about these street gangs, and the Lord prompted him. And he really felt stirred in his heart, I have got to go take the gospel to these gang members. And that's what he did, right? He goes to Brooklyn with hardly any money, just pretty much the clothes on his back, and begins to preach to these gang members and hold these little evangelistic rallies. And, and at first, he had a tough go at it. But he begins to minister to these gang members, and he encounters Nicky Cruz, and he begins to preach the gospel to him, telling him that, that God can change him, that, that the love of God could transform him, that, that he could turn to Jesus Christ. And he began to preach the power of the cross to Nicky Cruz, and Nicky hated Wilkerson. He cursed him out. He spat on him. He even hit him. But he would keep going back to preach the gospel to Nikki and the other gang members. There's a point in the story that's familiar to a lot of people where Nikki threatens to, to cut him up, right? For, for if he doesn't shut up and leave him alone. And Wilkerson says to him, You can cut me up in a thousand pieces and lay every one of those pieces on the ground, and each one of those pieces will declare that God loves you. I mean, it's a powerful powerful moment there. Those words rattled Nikki to such a powerful degree. It haunted him for weeks until eventually, right, he surrendered to Christ, right? The power of the cross, the power of forgiveness came upon him. The Spirit of God made him a new being. It was a radical transformation. It is a powerful and beautiful story. Nikki would go on to lead, together with David Wilkerson, a ministry that persists to this day called Teen Challenge, and you're probably familiar with it. But I remember as a young Christian reading that story and just marveled at the power of God to rescue and save and deliver people like Nikki Cruz. I didn't walk through a violent upbringing like that. I wasn't a, a gang member or any of those things and, or murdered people or did any of those things. And I, I didn't hear a testimony like that. I'm like, wow, if God could save Nikki Cruz, if God could use someone like him, then surely God can save anyone and he can use anyone. Have you ever thought that way? Have you ever thought, wow, I mean, think about the most hardened person you know in your life. Maybe there's someone that comes to mind, and you're thinking, man, if God could save that person. But sometimes we think we see those individuals, and we think they're beyond the reach of God, beyond the power of God to save them, because they're really bad people. They're doing horrific things. They blaspheme the name of God. They hate God. They're violent, or whatever sin it is that you think is so massive. So rebellious, so far gone, we might be tempted to think that they are out of the reach of God. Maybe you're here today and you're thinking, God can't save me. What I've done, he can't forgive me of these things. 
you might be feeling you're out of the reach of God. Today's passage that we're going to walk through is a fresh reminder for all of us that no one, absolutely no one, is out of the reach of God's mercy, God's grace, and His power to save. Even the most hardened and rebellious sinner. And that's good news for us. All right. Well, let's turn to the word of the Lord. In 1 Timothy, we're going to read verses 12 through 20. Hear the words of the Lord. I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service. Though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and insolent opponent, But I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. This saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. But I received mercy for this reason. That in me as the foremost... Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. To the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. This charge I entrust to you, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you, that by them you may wage the good warfare holding faith and a good conscience. By rejecting this, some have made shipwreck of their faith, among whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. This is the word of the Lord. Now, this passage contains probably one of the most powerful, succinct, poignant, and pregnant statements about the gospel that you will find in the New Testament. Because it encapsulates the gospel message, the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ, and it's found right there in verse 15. It's the center point of this passage. And it's only nine words in English, but it is so powerful. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. This is the message that Paul was entrusted with this glorious gospel of the blessed God that he talks about just a few verses in in verse 11. It's the message that Paul charges Timothy with guarding and defending. And it is the message that Paul suffered so greatly and labored so intently to bring to the Gentiles. Now in chapter 1 here, As we started reading this, we see these are primary instructions that Paul is giving to Timothy. Timothy, which he calls a beloved child of his, a spiritual son, he had left in Ephesus with a very particular charge to confront those who were teaching a different doctrine in the church. And he also, in this letter, is going to be giving him instructions and descriptions of things that the church ought to be doing. To behave rightly when they come together. And in verses 12 through 17 right now. If you notice he kind of deviates from those instructions. There's this this interruption of those instructions. And an excursus that Paul takes. A little detour. A little rabbit trail if you will. In which he now begins to burst forth with thanksgiving, praise and gratitude. And verse 11 seems to have prompted that. This, 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 this reference to this message, this gospel that was entrusted to him. And as he recalls that, as it comes to mind, he is filled with such deep gratitude and deep amazement regarding the overwhelming mercy and grace that God has shown him. That mercy transformed this apostle from an enemy of Christ into a prototype For the kind of person like Nicky Cruz. Like other hardened sinners, right? If God could save Paul and could call Paul into service, then God can save anybody and call them into service. Let's look at that statement in verse 15. Let's start there. And he said this is one of of five statements that Paul 
starts this way as, as a trustworthy saying. He says, this saying is trustworthy. And sometimes he even says, and is deserving of full acceptance. And each time, and this is only found in the pastoral epistles, each time he uses that, he's using that phrase to highlight something important, something he wants to draw attention to. And he says that this statement is deserving of full acceptance, something that should be universally accepted as true and truthful. Everyone should believe it. Everyone should embrace it. Everyone should accept it. And what is the statement he makes here? Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Do you believe that? Do you accept that as true? Let's look at each component of this gospel statement. Christ Jesus. Well, who is Christ Jesus? Who is he referring to? Well, he's referring to the divine son. The second person of the triune Godhead. Who is Christ Jesus? He is the image of the invisible God. He is the supreme one. He is the preeminent one. He has eternally existed. All things were created by him and for him. And he sustains everything he made by the word of his power. Who is Christ Jesus? Well, everything is subject to him. He has ultimate authority and everything exists for his glory and for his enjoyment. He is the firstborn from the dead. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. His throne is above every other throne. His name above every other name. He is the head of his church. He has a kingdom and his kingdom is everlasting. And he is coming again to judge the living and the dead. Who is this Jesus? Well, what we do know is that at his name, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And will confess that he is Lord. That's who Christ Jesus is. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Think about that. That person, that Jesus came into the world. The marvel of the mystery and the glory and the majesty of the incarnation of Jesus Christ. He did not come into existence when he was born of the Virgin Mary in Bethlehem. He has always existed. And, and, and we learn that this eternal God then wraps himself in human flesh, adding to his divine nature a human nature, two natures in the one person becoming the God-man. He comes in to this world. Paul writes in Philippians that Christ humbled himself, taking on the form of a servant and being born in the likeness of man. John writes in his gospel that the word became flesh and dwelt among us, tabernacled among us. What does this statement declare? It declares that this Christ, the Lord of glory, becomes a man, enters the mess of humanity. He enters into this sin-sick, cursed, and broken world, leaving the glories of the heavenly realm to step into darkness and decay. But to what end? For what purpose did he leave glory? Well, that statement tells us Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. To save sinners. And who are the sinners? They're all sitting right here. <laughs> all of us, right? All of humanity. Every one of us. Every one of us has transgressed God's law. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. There is none righteous. No, not one. All have turned aside. Every one of us has thumbed our nose up at God. Every one of us wants to pursue our own passions and the desires of our sinful flesh. We want to have it our way. Every one of us is born an enemy of God, hostile to God. We're born dead in our trespasses and sins. Scripture declares that we are sons of disobedience by nature, children of wrath. Those are the sinners that Jesus came to save. And that is every single one of us. 
Jesus did not come into the world to save good people. He didn't come into the world to save nice people. He didn't come into the world to save people who have declared themselves righteous. He did not come into the world to save people who feel like they have it all put together. Because here's the truth. From God's perspective, no one meets the qualifications of good, nice, righteous, or put together. Not a single human being. You know where all the good and moral and righteous people are apart from Christ? They're in hell. Hell is populated with good and nice and moral people. Who thought that their goodness and niceness And their self-righteousness and morality was all they needed for salvation apart from Christ. Hell is full of people like that. We are all jacked up sinners, brothers and sisters. Wretched, unrighteous, and deserving of hell. If you don't feel that you are, then you have no need of Christ, do you? The good news is that Christ came to save jacked up sinners like us he came to save sinners our lord himself said the son of man came to seek and save that which is lost so if you think you're righteous and if you think you're good on your own then you don't need christ and christ has nothing to do with you but how must we see ourselves we need to see ourselves as god's word declares that we truly are and truthfully are Wretched sinners in need of a savior. Here's the problem. It's the problem today. We don't think that we're that bad. We don't think we're as jacked up as God says we are. In fact, we see ourselves as victims. We see our sinful condition, but we look at it and we say, well, it's really a mistake. That the mistakes that we make because of what someone else did to us. And we might use the excuses as horrific they are, but because of abuse or because we've been marginalized or mistreated or oppressed or how our parents raised us or or our environment. This is why these things happen to me and this is why I do the things that I do. They're outside of me. They're external to me. The problem's out there. And sadly, from too many pulpits, the kind of gospel that's proclaimed is a gospel for victims and not a gospel for sinners. And that's a huge, huge problem because Jesus didn't come to save victims. And I'm not saying that Jesus doesn't deal with those who have been sinned against and are victims. I'm just telling you that he didn't come to save victims. He came to save sinners. He came to save sinners because the problem is not external. The problem's internal. The problem is the heart. And when it comes to sin, no one is a victim and no one is without excuse here. We have a dead heart. We have a dead heart dead in its affections for God. We have a heart that is unwilling to do what God commands of us to do. We have a heart that desires its own passions and its own sinful desires and pleasures. And scripture tells us that heart is bound up and enslaved to sin. That's a huge problem. The solution is then we need a new heart. We need a new nature that has affections for God. A new nature that would desire to do what pleases God. A heart that is freed from the tyranny of sin. A heart that is born again to life in God. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, to rescue us, deliver us, to give us that new heart. The gospel message is not that complicated. It's not that difficult to understand. It's not complex. He came to live the life that you and I could not live. You and I could never attain the righteousness that God requires through perfect obedience. But Jesus Christ did that for us. And he died the death that you and I deserved. You and I deserve the full wrath of God. You and I deserve to be punished for our sins. But Jesus took that upon himself for us, for you, and for me, for sinners. And Jesus rose from the dead in victory. Conquering the enemies that you and I could never 
ever defeat. Sin and death. And Paul says, this saying is trustworthy. You can stake your life on it. In fact, your life depends on it. What a contrast to the myths and the speculations of the false teachers. Preaching a different doctrine. These are true. In the second chapter there of 1 Timothy, Paul writes, For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men. The man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all. That is true. That is reality. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Well, now we have established that. Which sinners did he come to save? Which sinners can get in on this? Well, every sinner has an opportunity to get in on this. Paul even writes in chapter 2 that it is God's desire for all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. The offer is made. The offer is extended. Christ died for sinners. But we know not all get in on this, do they? So how do we get in on it? How do we get in on the gracious offer of the gospel of God's grace? Look what John writes in his gospel in the first chapter, verses 12 and 13. But to all who did receive him, Jesus, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but God. But God. Well, what is he telling us here? Well, one has to believe and receive Christ. That is the essence of repentance. To repent means to turn. To turn aside and to turn to. To repent means that we acknowledge our sinful condition before a holy God and turn to his remedy for that condition in the person of Jesus Christ. To believe and trust upon him. Believe who he says he, he, says he is. Acknowledge our spiritual poverty and trust in what he has done to accomplish salvation for us. Have you done that? Have you believed on him? Have you trusted in him and him alone? Jesus said in John 6, 40, For this is the will of my Father, that everyone, listen, everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life. And I will raise him up on the last day. Have you looked on the Son? Have you looked on the Son? Have you trusted in Him? Do you believe Him? If so, you, a sinner, can get in on this and have eternal life through Him. Here's what Paul knows and here's what we know. The gospel has the power to turn sinners into saints. Isn't that awesome? The gospel has the power to transform a sinner into a son. And that's why Paul takes this moment now to give his resume, his testimony in the midst of what he's doing and giving this outburst of thanksgiving and show of gratitude and praise. In verse 13, he starts referring to his past behavior. Look what he says he was. He says, I was a blasphemer, a persecutor, an insolent opponent. Paul was an enemy of Christ. Paul hated Christ and he hated his people. He hated his followers. He persecuted the church. Listen to Paul's testimony when he was arrested and he was before King Agrippa in Acts chapter 26, 9 through 11. He said, I myself was convinced that I ought to do many things in opposing the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And I did so in Jerusalem. I not only looked up Many of the saints in prison after receiving authority from the chief, locked up rather, many of the saints in prison after receiving authority from the chief priests, but when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them, and I punished them often in all the synagogues and tried to make them blaspheme, and in raging fury against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. Paul was a bad dude. Paul was an enemy of Christ. Paul 
rejected Christ, denied Christ. He aggressively persecuted the people of Christ. There was no one worse than Paul. There was no one that, that would, could, could rack up this list of heinous accomplishments in his pursuit of destroying and wiping the name of Christ out of everyone's mouth and off the face of the earth. Even Christians were afraid of him. Can you imagine some of these Christians thinking about what Paul was doing and thinking about Paul and saying, this guy's a blasphemer. There is no way, no way there's going to be any salvation for him. There is no hope for Paul because he's an enemy of Christ. You and I would have said that. You and I have thought of that about some others. For sure the Christians in this time did. But listen. <laughs> Look what he writes as he continues here. But I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Paul's saying I was all those things. I was all those things. I was the worst of the worst, the foremost sinner, the chief of sinners, the least of the least. But I received the undeserved mercy and grace of our Lord. So who is beyond God's ability to save, brothers and sisters? No one. Absolutely no one. God is rich in mercy. Later on after his conversion, look what Paul wrote in Romans chapter 1. You're familiar with this. Verse 16 and 17, he says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and then to the the Greek, for in the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. He's not ashamed, for it is what? The power of God. Unto salvation. How does he know that? Well he came face to face. With the transforming power. Of the gospel. And the power of God. Unto salvation. And then he says. This grace of God. Overflowed for me. With faith and love. That are in Christ Jesus. And I love that language there. This overflowing. Super abundant grace. That grace. The undeserved. Unmerited. Favor and kindness of God. Towards sinful man overflowed towards Paul and overflowed in Paul's life like a river overflows its banks and and floods the land like pouring the ocean into a cup that kind of overflowing is what's in view here and that grace that overflowed in his life produced faith and love in Paul's life faith that replaced his previous unbelief love That replaced this brutal hatred he had for those that now he calls brothers and sisters in the Lord. Who can do that? Who could cause something like that? Only the power of the gospel. Only the power of Christ to save and deliver and transform. This faith and love can only be found in the person of Christ. They belong to Christ. And they're the visible expressions of Christian living in divine fellowship and in divine relationship with Christ. Faith and love, evidentiary proof of the gospel's power to transform a life for the glory of Christ. God's grace and a recognition of what God has done for us should humble us. There's no place for boasting, is there? Salvation is a work of God from beginning to end. You are not saved by your works. You're not saved on your own. There is no exertion of your will that can produce salvation or belief in your life. If the Spirit does not open your heart and put a new heart in you to stir up faith and belief, it can only be found and done by Christ. At the thought of what God rescued him from, In his former life, Paul has this sudden sense of self-abasement. Look what he says. He says, I am the foremost. What does he mean by that? I'm the chief sinner. You look up sinner in the dictionary, my picture's right there. Chief sinner, foremost sinner, worst of the worst. Sinner of sinners, right? That's what he's saying here. In, in, in other passages, in 1 Corinthians, he refers to himself as the least of the apostles. 
He says, I'm unworthy to be an apostle because I persecuted the church. This is what he thought about himself. In Ephesians, he he calls himself the very least of all the saints. Paul was so vividly aware of his own sin that he couldn't even conceive that anyone could possibly be worse than he was. There, there, there's no one who could possibly have topped the sin and the atrocities I committed against Christ in his church. For the rest of his life, Paul would be overwhelmed by the thought of how, how Christ would save someone like him. Overwhelmed by, by the thought of how the grace of God was so lavished upon someone like him who, who formerly killed Christ's followers. That's That's amazing. Do you feel that way? Do you feel the same way as Paul when you think about your own sin and then think about the grace that came to you? The mercy that was shown you? The sad thing is most Christians don't see that. They they don't see sin for what it truly is. They don't see their condition as being as bad as it truly is. Consequently, They don't get grace. They don't understand grace. And you know how I know that? Because most Christians don't forgive very easily. A person who can't forgive does not know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because when you understand grace and when you understand what you've been forgiven of, you'll never have a moment in your life where you're going to say, I'm going to withhold forgiveness from someone else. I'm going to withhold extending grace for someone else. Until they do X, Y, and Z. Well, that's not how we were treated in Christ, was it? You and I have been forgiven of far more than we will ever need to forgive anyone else. You and I have been shown a grace so lavish that has overflowed in our life. That has cleansed us of our sin. And made us righteous and clean before our Lord. That should overwhelm us should overwhelm us to think of the kindness and mercy and grace that came into our life. We must never forget what we were delivered from, brothers and sisters. And often the longer we're in this thing, right, the easier it is to forget. We forget what we were taken out of. We forget what we were rescued from. John Bunyan in his classic work, Grace Abounding to the Chief of Sinners, writes, it is profitable for Christians to be often calling to mind the very beginning of grace with their souls. It's profitable to reflect on that, to meditate on that, and to meditate on when grace shone in your heart. He goes on to write, oh, the remembrance of my great sins, of my great temptations, and of my great fears of perishing forever. They bring afresh into my mind the remembrance of my great help, my great support from heaven, and the great grace that God extended to such a wretch as I. Do you remember? Do you take the time to think about what he delivered you from and brought you out of how he rescued you from the domain of darkness and transferred you into the kingdom of his beloved son? Do you? Do you think about that? Do you reflect on it? Do you share that with others? This is where our testimony is important. This is why it's important to share it with other people so they understand. Now, that must be coupled with the proclamation of the good news. But you share, look what Christ delivered me from. And look at the grace that has come into my life. And that should overwhelm us. Oh, when I begin to think about what, what, a, what a depressed teenager I was. Mind in complete darkness and filth. Fascinated with the occult. Oppressed by demonic forces. Going through life, stumbling and fumbling about as a teenager. And then the grace of God came into my life. Radically transformed me. Messed me up in every way imaginable. And here I am 30 some odd years later. 
God's still working in my heart, still sanctifying me, still lavishing His grace upon me. Wave after wave after wave of His grace. How could that not overflow in my life to worship and adoration and gratitude and thanksgiving? When you think about it, it your eyes should well up with tears. It should stir your heart to love God for what He delivered you from. And if that is not your experience, then I don't know what to tell you. Something's wrong. Something's wrong because maybe you don't think you are a sinner in need of a Savior. Maybe you think your sin isn't that wrong and grievous, an offense to God. If your sin isn't that grievous and an offense, then the cross is the most foolish thing ever imaginable. Then the cross is completely unnecessary. For in the cross, your sin was punished. My sin was punished. A death we deserved. Oh, but man, when we get that, our response is like that of Paul's right here. Gratitude, gratitude. Now, Paul, in verse 16, discerns the reason for God's gracious dealing with him. I think this is beautiful, what he recognizes here. He says, but I receive mercy for this reason. And look what he begins to say here. For this is, this is the reason God showed mercy to me. That as the chief sinner, right, the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. That in Paul, Christ is displaying his perfect patience so that Paul now will serve forever as an example for future believers. Display his perfect patience. Now, you and I don't have perfect patience, right? Like, I lose my mind in traffic. (laughs) You know, I'm not patient in lines, right? We're not patient when we don't get our way. But here, what's Paul saying? That in God's dealing with me, in God showing grace to me, in God saving a sinner like me, the worst of the worst, his perfect patience is displayed. Aren't you glad God is patient with us? That God is patient with sinners? Doesn't matter how bad and bleak and rebellious and hardened those sinners look. God is patient. He is slow to anger. Now we're not. Like, it, like if we were God, like one offense, we'd smite them, right? One word, just singe them. There'd be nobody left. That's not God. God doesn't treat us as we deserve. He's slow to anger. He is patient. He's patient with someone like Paul who persecuted the church. And he says that becomes an example. That word example in the Greek means rough sketch. Think of like like an outline or a stencil. right? That's what he's saying here. That what happened to Paul is going to be a stencil, a rough outline of what will come to be the blessed experience of countless others, right? Who will receive mercy and grace to believe in Christ. Paul becomes the portrait of God turning the worst of the worst sinners into saints. And isn't that true? Here we are 2,000 years later using Paul as an example. Of the grace of God to the chief of sinners, the worst of the worst. And if God could be patient with Paul, he can be patient with us. There's no hopeless cause. There's no one beyond the reach of God's arm to save, to deliver, to rescue from sin. No one is beyond the mercy of God. Or maybe somebody you're praying for. There may be somebody that's on your mind. Well, here's the hope we have. Look what God can do. Look how God can rescue. Look how God can save. God chose to take the chief persecutor of the church and make him the chief apostle of the church to show that he's patient, to show that he's loving, to show that he's kind, to show that he is gracious and merciful. Towards sinners.
no matter who you are, no matter what you've done, these words are trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. Do you believe them? Now, it's easy to see why Paul is so grateful, why he bursts forth with thanksgiving and praise in the middle of this letter to Timothy. Immense gratitude towards God. He writes in verse 12, I thank him, and he gives three reasons. I thank him for he's given me strength. I thank him because he's judged me faithful. I thankful because he's appointing me to his service. He appointed me to his service in spite of who he was. Look what God's mercy does when it comes into Paul's life here. Grace overwhelms him that as he's writing, he's got to take a break and, and, and just burst into this spontaneous doxology. And this isn't the only place he does it, right? There's several of his letters he's writing and something just kind of blows his mind about the mercy and grace of God. So he's like, I got to write about that too. <laughs> he's texting it. I don't know what he was doing back then. Carb- no, parchment, parchment, all right? So look what he writes here, right? When he thinks about this. This, this, and, and, the, and what he writes in verse 17 here is most likely, many scholars believe this early liturgical formulation borrowed from Judaism, but probably became a creedal statement in the early church. In verse 17, to the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. So as he's thinking about the grace of God and the, the, the rich mercy of God towards him and, and praise is overflowing, he just he uses a statement that most likely is familiar to Timothy. Right? God is the supreme and eternal king. He's the king of the ages. He governs all things. He governs all ages from creation all the way to the end of the age. He's outside of time. He's beyond the fluctuations of time. And he says he is immortal. He's immortal. That word immortal means not subject to the ravages of decay and death. He is immortal. Not, not Highlander. God cannot be killed. Will never die. Contemplate that. Reflect on that. Meditate. Praise God for that. He is invisible. He is the, beyond our ability of our human eyes to fully gaze upon the glory of this being who is light unimaginable. And he is the only God. The one and only unique. He is God and there is no other. No one else like <coughs> So he writes, to him be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. How often do you reflect on God's grace? How often do you reflect on it and and are overcome with thanksgiving and praise? If you haven't done that, I want to encourage you today to do that. Don't put your head on your pillow tonight until you've done that. And worship God for it. Glorify God for it. Thank Him for it. Now Paul, at the end of chapter 1 here, is, gets back to the business at hand. And we'll go through this quickly here. He gets back to the purpose and theme of his letter, right? He takes that little rabbit trail and, and he's found his way back. It's kind of like one of those preachers who goes on all these rabbit trails. Most don't ever find their way back to their main point. Uh, but Paul does find it here and So we'll follow him along here, right? In light of God's gracious gospel, right, Paul charges Timothy to wage the good warfare. Some of your translations say to fight the good fight. Well, what is the good fight? What is the good fight? The good fight, he calls in 1 Timothy 6.12, he calls it the good fight of the faith, right? The faith, right, is shorthand For the gospel, the sound doctrine, the good deposit, right? The truth is at stake. The truth of the gospel. So he's telling him, you need to wage the good warfare. You need to engage in this good battle for the truth. Timothy, you cannot remain neutral in this fight. You can't sit on the fence 
You can't sit idly by while these false teachers are in the church spreading their lies and their deception and their false teaching, their different doctrine that is distorting the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why? Well, as we've just seen, the gospel is so glorious, so powerful, so gracious that he cannot permit anyone to teach a different gospel to the saints of God. Cannot have anyone teach something that subtracts or adds anything to this glorious gospel. Now look what Paul appeals to. Two things in charging Timothy with this assignment. First, he reminds Timothy of his father-son relationship. He goes back to that. I entrust you, Timothy, my child. Right? My child. This is, this is his son. Paul mentored him. Paul discipled him. He raised him in the faith. And though Timothy might be feeling intimidated by these false teachers, he might feel that he doesn't have the experience or that he might be ill-equipped, Paul is confident in assigning him to the task at hand. So he reminds him of that relationship. Secondly, he reminds him of the circumstances of his ordination. Somehow during his ordination, there were prophetic words made about Timothy. We don't know the substance of those prophecies. They're not found in Scripture here. All right, so we don't know what they are, but it doesn't matter. In 1 Timothy 4.14, Paul writes again to encourage him, Do not neglect the gift you have, which was given you by prophecy when the council of elders laid their hands on you. So it's likely these prophecies he is speaking about were at this time when Timothy was ordained and he was set into his office and sent out to minister. And these prophecies set him apart for ministry, gifted him and authorized him then to exercise that gift. So he was following whatever these prophecies were that Timothy would and could wage this good warfare. So he tells him, remember, you're my beloved son. You're my son in the faith, confident in you. And remember those prophetic words that were given to you, right? Remembering those two things and holding on to the faith and good conscience. That's how Timothy was to wage this good warfare. Faith and good conscience must be preserved together. Faith is the faith, the gospel, the truths of the gospel, our belief in those things, our conviction about those, and our good conscience. Where We talked about the moral and ethical implications of the gospel, the good works of the gospel, the things we do, the outworking of that gospel in our life that produces good works. All right, so belief and behavior, conviction and conscience, those are closely linked and they must be preserved. A genuine faith works itself out in the life of the believer to produce the good works of the faith. And Paul tells Timothy in 4.16, then to keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Watch your own life, Timothy. Watch how you conduct yourself. And watch for the purity of the gospel. Make sure you keep that and preserve that. Watch your life and your doctrine. Absolutely essential to wage this good warfare. Because here's the thing. The false teachers who are perverting the gospel did not, none of those things. They didn't do either of those things. And Paul now gives us two names that for, are forever memorialized in Scripture as people who shipwrecked their faith who did not hold to the faith and do not hold to a good conscience. Hymenaeus and Alexander. I'm sorry if your middle name or something is Alexander. And the Bible doesn't paint him in a good picture here, does it? Hymenaeus, I've never come across that individual in my life. So clearly people avoided using that as a baby name. Okay, But these two people, right, shipwrecked their faith. And Paul then excommunicates these individuals from the church. That's what he means here. It's just technical stuff right here. Handing them over to Satan. Okay, this harkens back to the whole issue back at Corinth, which we don't want to get into at the moment here, right? But he had to do the same thing in enacting church discipline and putting out the incestuous brother from the congregation who would not repent. He's handed over to Satan to be buffeted. Here they're handed over to Satan to learn not to blaspheme. It's a serious matter. The gospel is not to be tampered with. 
And here is why churches must engage in church discipline to deal with things like this. It's not that they were just, hey, you you can't come to church anymore and they just go back about their happy little life in pagan society. That's not what's taking place here. This is a deeply spiritual matter when an individual is rightly excommunicated from the fellowship of the believers in the church. Because the implication here and the understanding here from Paul would be that this individual being handed over to Satan means he's no longer under God's care and protection as he would be under the church and in fellowship with the church. And now he's open to every attack from the evil one. Physical attacks, probably illness, probably other things are in view here. It's a serious thing. And sometimes waging the good warfare for the church is to take these kinds of severe measures with a person who is not repenting of teaching false doctrine or uh, aberrations and distortions of the gospel. It's a serious thing. Sadly, most churches suck at doing church discipline. Uh, But by God's grace, we won't be one of those. But it's a serious thing, and we'll do it. There's a reminder here for all of us. Because these individuals, Hymenaeus and Alexander, a lot of scholars believe these were elders in the church or significant leaders in the church. That's sobering. None of us are immune to the temptation to wander from the gospel. This is why we have to be on the alert. This is why you have to watch our life and our teaching and our doctrine. We're to wage the good warfare in every facet of our lives. You have a real spiritual enemy, brothers and sisters. We go about our day to day not even thinking about that half the time. An enemy who wants to distract us and deviate us from the gospel through deception, through division. And Paul's reminding Timothy and reminding us by extension, we have to keep the faith and a good conscience. We don't let our guard down. What kind of soldier lets their guard down right in the arena of warfare? Not a good one, right? Yeah, we will be dead. Be taken out. The gospel is worth guarding and defending. The true gospel. That's the hill to die on. That is the hill we will die on. As a church for the true gospel of Jesus Christ. And this glorious gospel brothers and sisters. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Is worth defending. And it is worth celebrating forever and ever. Amen and amen.